So in this video, we're going to explore some of the characteristics and causes of volcanic activity and also link that to some of the hazards that are created by volcanic activity. The map that you can see on the screen now shows you the distribution of volcanic activity around the world. Um, probably won't come as much surprise to us that the majority of those volcanoes, uh, the red dots on the map, are located on plate boundaries. Although that doesn't necessarily explain the location of all volcanoes, um, as we can in some cases get volcanic activity happening away from a plate boundary. So it's important that we link back to our understanding of plate boundaries to help us understand the general pattern um, of volcanic activity around the world. So in the case of examples uh, or locations number one and two on this map, this is where we have subduction occurring, where one oceanic plate is sinking beneath another plate, um, whether that's continental in the case of South America um, or oceanic in the case um, of New Zealand. And um, as a result of that subduction, the oceanic plate is melting, that's creating magma which rises towards the surface, it breaks through the crust um, and therefore we experience volcanic eruptions. On the other hand, in locations three and four, we've got divergence occurring, we've got plates moving apart, um, what we would call a constructive plate boundary. Um, that can be oceanic and oceanic crust diverging, as is the case of the, the mid-Atlantic ridge, um, most notably in Iceland, um, or in the case of location number four, where we've got two um, bits of continental crust separating, so the East African Rift Valley um, and the volcanic activity associated with that um, occurring as a result of the divergence of that continental crust. As the crust separates, that causes weaknesses, um, it relieves pressure on the asthenosphere below, so that molten magma is then able to um, reach the surface. As I said, though, we do find evidence of volcanic activity happening away from plate boundaries. Um, the most um, famous example of that is the, the Hawaiian islands and the chain of islands that um, stretches away from Hawaii, um, which has been formed by a hotspot. Um, a hotspot is associated with a mantle plume, um, an area of high heat flow within the mantle. Um, and where that hotspot um, interacts with the crust, you get magma breaking through and building up um, to create uh, volcanoes. And as the plate moves over the top of it, those volcanoes are then taken away from the hotspot and a new volcano forms in its place. So there's no surprises that um, as a result of these tectonic processes, um, volcanoes tend to be found um, close to uh, plate margins. So when we have a look at this map here, we can see a slightly different pattern. This map has been inflated or deflated in certain areas, depending on the population size. And it instantly draws our attention to those places where we have the highest number of people um, living in close proximity um, to volcanoes. Now, although um, there are a lot of areas on this map, some of them are perhaps even more um, important than others when we think about the risk to hazards. So even though Iceland, for example, up here, uh, might have lots of volcanoes, it's got a relatively small population and therefore um, we're not too worried about the, the number of people who are vulnerable to volcanic eruptions here. Areas like Japan, however, the Philippines and Indonesia um, in Asia, countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, and in the um, east of Africa in countries like Ethiopia um, and even in southern Europe, um, places around Vesuvius and um, Mount Etna uh, in Italy um, and certainly in Central America as well, have quite large populations living in close proximity to volcanoes. Another important aspect um, of understanding volcanic activity is understanding the types of lava, because not all lava is the same. It has different characteristics depending on where it has been formed and how it's been formed. So one type of lava um, at one end of the scale is what we would call basaltic lava. Um, this is lava um, that is quite high in temperature and also um, is quite low in a mineral called silica. Now, silica is um, a mineral which 
and alters the viscosity of the magma. When you have um, lots of silica, the magma is very thick. Where you have very little silica, um, the magma is very runny. And that viscosity, um, in this case with basaltic lava it being very runny, means that the gases can escape easily. Um, and gas within magma is the thing which powers the eruption. Eruptions are really driven by the amount of gas within the magma and how easily that gas is able to escape. So where you have less silica in the magma, you get a runnier consistency. That means the gas can escape more easily. Um, and that creates what we would call effusive eruptions like we can see in the picture down here. Rivers of lava, lava fountains, um, and um, lava does tend to be the primary hazard um, in these sorts of sorts of eruptions. This is most common uh, maybe at hot spots like in Hawaii um, or at constructive margins, maybe like um, Iceland or um, Mount Nirugongo. On the other hand, andesitic or uh, rhyolitic lavas um, are almost the opposite in consistency. Um, they're lower in temperature and they're also very high um, in this Mag, um, in this mineral silica. So that results in them being quite thick and sticky um, or with a high viscosity. That means that the gases get trapped really easily. So um, any gas that was building up in that, that magma is not able to escape and that adds pressure to the eruption and it means that when that volcano does erupt um, those eruptions tend to be quite explosive. Um, Therefore, we're maybe more likely to get um, ash and pyroclastic material being the primary hazard rather than lava itself. And this tends to be quite common um, at destructive plate margins. Um, so the Andes in South America or um, the Caribbean, those kind of locations, the Philippines, Japan, they tend to experience explosive eruptions because of the type of magma um, or type of lava that is being released by those eruptions. One thing that we need to be aware of regarding volcanic hazards is how we measure the magnitude of those events. Um, so we use a scale called the Volcano Explosivity Index. Um, you might often see this abbreviated to VEI. Um, and this is a classification that we use to determine the scale of any given volcanic eruption. Um, it's a nine point scale, so it can be um, ranging from zero up to eight. Um, there's no kind of midpoints or anything like that. So it can't be a 4.2 or anything like that, like you might get for measuring earthquakes. Um, volcanoes and their eruptions fit into one of these nine categories. Um, the level of VEI or the, the level on the volcano explosivity index is determined predominantly um, by this category here, the volume of material ejected by um, a particular eruption. Um, and as you can see, as we go up that scale, um, we can see that we're going up by a power of 10 each time. Um, so a, a VEI of four, for example, releases 0 0.1 cubic kilometers of material. Um, whereas a VEI of five releases one cubic kilometre of material. Um, so this scale is known as a logarithmic scale. It's going up by a factor of 10 um, each time you move up that scale. There are other ways in which we can classify volcanic eruptions. So um, that can be in terms of maybe the, the style of eruption. Um, so a Hawaiian style eruption, for example, um, is, is gentle, it's effusive. Um, we might get lava fountains, whereas um, a Pelean or a Plinian eruption, uh, they are very explosive um, eruptions with large ash clouds and lots of pyroclastic material. Um, you can also get a sense here when we look on the right hand side um, of the frequency um, of those sorts of eruptions. So um, a volcanic eruption of a VEI of zero, for example, that might be um, a volcano with a lava lake um, that is just bubbling away um, almost constantly. Um, 
volcano with a VEI of one. Um, the example here of Stromboli um, in um, in Italy that erupts on a daily basis. Several times a day, there are small eruptions going on, um, sending a plume of of ash, maybe a few hundred meters up into the into the air. Whereas as we go up that scale and we start to think about things like um, an eruption of VEI of a five or a six, they maybe only happen every um, 50 to 100 years. Um, so we can think about that relationship between um, the magnitude and the frequency of events um, as being the same as for other hazards, really, that large frequency events tend to occur less often um, and lower magnitude events tend to occur more often. So when we think about the hazards created by volcanic activity, we can divide those hazards into two groups. We can either have primary hazards, which are the direct result of volcanic eruptions, or we can have secondary hazards, which occur as a knock-on effect of the primary hazards. So an example of a primary hazard might be lava flows. These are obviously occurring as a direct result um, of the eruption of a volcano. Um, these tend not to actually cause that much threat to human life because the lava doesn't tend to move that quickly. It's maybe um, you know, a few kilometers an hour um, for basaltic lava flows, maybe just a few centimeters an hour if we're thinking about andesitic or rhyolitic lava. So it tends to pose more of a threat to vegetation and property than it does to human life. There are some exceptions to that though. Uh, Mount Niragongo in um, the DRC, for example, um, the lava there has a very unusual chemical composition that makes it incredibly runny. Um, and combined with the steep slopes um, of the volcano, the, the lava can travel um, up to maybe 100 kilometers an hour, nearly 70 miles an hour um, down the slopes of that, of that volcano. Um, more likely though is the case that fires might be triggered um, or that roads are going to be covered or possibly airport runways might be blocked um, and obviously that lava is going to solidify into solid rock um, and therefore even once it's um, cooled down and hardened that then presents a, a challenge to people. There's also the problem that we'll come on to later in terms of how that lava can interact with, um, with snow and ice. The other primary hazard that we can associate with volcanic eruptions um, is that of, of ash, or what we actually call tephra is actually the, the proper name that we use for any volcanic material that is ejected during an eruption. So this consists of either maybe tiny fragments of ash up to um, larger volcanic bombs. Um, and this is material that's ejected during an eruption. It's actually the lava um, that is shattered into, into tiny fragments, and that can be ejected um, for quite some distance from the volcano itself. That poses a hazard because um, the ash can um, cause breathing difficulties, um, it can land on the, on the roofs of buildings, and even a very small um, coating of ash on a building is actually enough to make the roof collapse or to bring down electricity pylons. Um, Obviously, when we start to think about the impact that that ash has um, in terms of burying vegetation and damaging crops, um, then that can also present other hazards. Um, and the ash on the ground itself also um, is not very permeable. And that um, can then have impacts in terms of increasing the runoff from any subsequent rainfall um, and ultimately um, leading to flooding, which would obviously be a, be a secondary hazard as a result of um, or an eruption. Gases are another primary hazard um, and these can occur either during an eruption um, or just more generally in areas of volcanic activity. So all magma contains gas um, and that gas is trying to escape from the magma and escape towards the surface um, either through cracks and fissures in the ground or possibly through hydrothermal systems as well. So things like geysers and fumaroles um, are a way of that gas escaping. Um, water vapor is actually the most abundant gas that, that comes out of um, volcanoes when they erupt. But we're not too worried about water vapor really because it's not hazardous. Um, however, gases like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide or hydrogen sulfide um, 
hydrogen chloride as well. Those are, are poisonous gases and um, they can also react with water in the atmosphere um, to create um, acid rain um, that can then fall back to earth as, um, as I say, as acid rain, which can pollute water supplies. Um, but even just the mixing of those gases with water that's in the air um, can then um, form form poisonous acids, which if you breathe those in or get them into your eyes, um, they can be really irritant. Um, longer term, um, gases also pose a, a problem because if we're ejecting very, very small particles of um, sulfur in particular, very high up into the atmosphere, um, we call those particles aerosols. What they do um, is, is block out or reflect rather um, some of the solar radiation that's coming from the sun. So they prevent it from reaching um, the Earth's surface. What that means is that can have climatic effects in the long term. So when there was a big eruption um, of a volcano, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. It's one of the biggest eruptions of recent years. Um, that was a VEI of six and it released so many aerosols that actually globally across the whole world, temperatures fell by one degree C the following year. So one of the bigger concerns about large scale volcanic eruptions is actually the climatic impacts that they have um, and that those cl climatic impacts have long term consequences and they also have consequences far beyond um, the location um, of the actual eruption itself. Moving on to secondary hazards then, these are the things that are hazardous but as an indirect result of the eruption. Um, one of the most dangerous things um, in a volcanic eruption is the potential of a lahar. So a lahar is the name we give to a volcanic mud flow. Um, so the mud in this case is created by volcanic debris, ash and boulders and rocks mixing with water um, and then flowing often at quite some speed down a slope or down an existing river valley um, and then inundating areas further um, downhill or downstream from the summit of the volcano. Now, obviously, the ash comes from the eruptive, explosive phase of the eruption, um, but it can sit idle for many weeks, even months, because it's not held together very well. It's not um, it's not well consolidated. It's very loose. Any heavy rainfall that might then subsequently land on that material, um, it has the potential to trigger a lahar. They have a consistency that's a little bit like wet concrete. So it's very, very thick. It's very viscous. Um, if you happen to be trapped in it, um, then it's very difficult to escape from. And certainly once the lahar has finished, if you like, and that material settles, it does set hard um, and get a little bit like concrete. One of the most tragic examples of um, where lahars have had a very devastating impact um, is the place that you can see in this photo here, um, the town of Armero in Colombia, um, when the volcano Nevada del Rui erupted in 1985, um, 21,000 people um, in this town lost their lives because they were caught unexpectedly um, by a lahar coming down the side of that volcano um, and flowing through the town. Flooding isn't something that we might initially associate with volcanic activity, but particularly um, in places like Iceland, this is a significant hazard. That's because lots of the volcanoes lie uh, within very close proximity or even underneath um, large ice caps. So when that magma works its way to the surface, it's melting vast quantities of ice. That ice becomes water uh, and that water then flows down um, the sides of the volcano, which can trigger quite devastating, um, quite devastating floods. Um, in Iceland, they actually have a name for this, this type of flooding. They call it a Jökulhalp. Um, and actually what can happen is the water will collect very slowly um, at the top of uh, a volcano, maybe in a kind of crater lake that's forming as a result of the melting of the ice as the lava works its way through the ice cap. But then suddenly one of those crater lakes will burst um, and that water will rush towards um, the coast. This was 
particularly prevalent after the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in um, 2010 along the south coast of Iceland. There was quite extensive flooding. Probably the most dangerous um, hazard that we associate with volcanic activity um, are pyroclastic flows, also uh, called nuée ardente, which in French means burning cloud. Um, and that sums up quite nicely what, what these features are. They are gravity-driven um, masses of rock and gases um, flowing at very, very great speed down the side um, of a volcano. You can think about them a little bit like um, an avalanche, but rather than it being a cold material, this is a burning hot, maybe up to 900 degrees C cloud of material. Um, they can move incredibly quickly, maybe four or five hundred miles an hour down the slopes of a volcano, and they are incredibly uh, disruptive um, and damaging. So if you happen to be caught in one, um, asphyxiation and burial um, within that material, um, you're likely to be burnt. It's going to destroy all the property and infrastructure that might be in its way. And there really is no effective method of mitigating against a pyroclastic flow other than making sure that people um, have been evacuated. So that sums up the main things that we need to know about the characteristics of and hazards created by volcanic activity. Obviously, we also need to be able to apply um, these theoretical points to um, some case studies and be able to think about how these things actually play out in the real world.